Today, what does the Hain Report mean to mortgage brokers and financial advisors? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. I've got Chris Bates with me again today, and we're going to discuss the Hain Royal Commission final report, which came out yesterday. Chris, of course, is right in the middle of this because he's both a mortgage broker and uh, in the financial sector as well, more broadly. So, Chris, welcome. I think you're a bit shocked. I am, Martin, and uh, good to be on the show again. I, uh, I'm actually very devastated, to be honest, because I really wanted the Royal Commission. I was all for it. I've worked in banks. I've worked at you know, financial advice institutions that were taken to shreds through the Royal Commission. I was loving the Royal Commission. I was loving everything that the Royal Commission was exposing, you know, all the things that needed to come out, um, you know, the flaws with, you know, vertical alignment and, you know, channeling products through banks and, you know, financial institutions, um, mis-selling of insurance and credit cards and small business loans. It was all great, and I, I thought that at the end of it, what we were going to see is, um, you know, much tighter rules around lending. I thought responsible lending was was going to be extremely tight, and I thought the banks would have to verify expenses, um, which isn't going to be the case. Um, but the most important thing, I thought vertical alignment, and I thought the banks would have to get rid of um, their advice arms, and I thought they wouldn't be able to own dealer groups and conflicts of interest. And I thought places like AMP wouldn't be able to provide financial advice and. You know, and that's not the case. They've they've kind of walked away from it all. I think the other problem is that, um, you know, they've gone and thrown mortgage brokers under the bus because you know that was there was a bit of a conspiracy that the the banks wanted the Royal Commission because the one thing that they wanted to do was to start back winning home loans again, and that's what they're going to you know get. Right. So let's just start with mortgage brokers and then we'll work on th through some of the other subjects. Of course, the um, Royal Commission exposed a whole bunch of bad behaviour from the mortgage broking sector, specifically around um, perhaps, uh, you know, taking bribes and those sorts of things. Um, and you could therefore argue that perhaps mortgage brokers were an easy target. Yeah, I mean, there's, there was, without doubt, there's some been new reform to brokers, but, you know, there was... You could basically recommend one lender and start get volume-based rebates. You know, lenders would provide incentives that additional on top and bonuses and, and things like that. Like, they've all kind of been stopped and they needed to be stopped and it wasn't fair. You know, the standardization of commissions has kind of happened as well where one lender could offer you a lot more than other lenders and that conflict just never needed to be there. Another conflict that was there is, you know, you would be paid on how much you actually recommend um, and how much someone borrows, not on how much they've got in cash and savings and things like that. So you could actually recommend more money, get paid more, and then the borrower would actually have a lower loan because they put the money in offset accounts. And so all those things, they were conflicts, they needed to be fixed, and new reform has come in to fix those. But generally speaking, you know, you know a lot of the other conflicts, you know, aren't really there. And I think that's the, the problem is that, you know, the, yeah, it's kind of missed the whole point. And then the, I guess where they're trying to take mortgage brokers out of the picture by removing, you know, their business model, basically, they won't be profitable under a new business model. So you're basically, you know, you've got rid of brokers, I guess, and then you've stopped the fund flow to international banks and second tier banks and, you know, creating competition. And that's what I think that, you know, the new structure will create is just no competition. Well, let's take it one step at a time. So effectively, the first thing that uh, the report said was that uh, trailing commissions over the next 18 months should effectively be turned off. So all the existing trailing commissions will be grandfathered, but no new trailing commissions can be written, right? So that essentially means that the income flow of brokers will, will start immediately to, to be hit. Uh, and, and then they say, uh, that beyond that, then ultimately they want to end up with a fixed fee that would not be paid by the bank, but would be paid by the uh, potential borrower, right, which is what's happened, for example, in the UK and other places too. And the argument was that there is conflicted remuneration at the moment, because as you say, 
if you make a bigger loan, you get a bigger commission. Um, many brokers weren't disclosing all of the factors around the decisions they were taking and may actually recommend a loan that was less suitable for a, a customer yeah. simply because the commission was bigger. So that was the, that was the concern. Um, the, the, the thought I had is that, um, of course, the uh, treasurer said, well, we're going to have a checkpoint before we go down that route. So effectively, the training commissions is, is locked in, right? Potentially, everyone's saying they're going to do that. Yeah. But then the next bit of the puzzle is, well, will they then pursue the idea of moving from uh, some sort of uh, 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 value volume based to fixed fee, right? And should that fixed fee be paid for by the bank or should it be paid for by the borrower? Now, the Haynes report says it should be the the potential borrower. I suppose there's a middle ground that says, well, maybe banks could move to a fixed fee rather than a variable fee, which would take out some of the conflicts. But it really does, as you say, question fundamentally the raison d'etre of a mortgage broker, because if you look at the penetration of mortgage broking services, a lot of them come from non-banks and from small banks. So effectively, it increases the playing field when it comes to propositions in the marketplace. And if the broker sector is effectively taken out, and it means that consumers essentially would have to pay, well, less people perhaps will actually go for the broker channel, and therefore it becomes effectively a spiral down into something which is not very pleasant and potentially just reinforces the position of the big four banks. That's, that's what I think the, the story is, right? Yeah, I mean, I, fundamentally, you're, you're, you're going to a broker is going to cost you money now, and before it didn't, because you would, that broker would go to the market, would find the best deal for you, and then would do all the paperwork, get you figure out what that is, this right structure, educate you, lodge the application, chase up the bank, do all of that, not cost you a single dollar, and get you the best deal. But now you go, well, now the broker's got to be three or $4,000, and do I need to pay that, or can I do it myself? And, or can I just walk into the bank and get it? And, you know, and that's, that's the case where, you know, most people will just go, I don't want to pay that fee, so I'll go directly to the branch. And, you know, they, ING haven't got branches, Macquarie haven't got branches, you know. All these second tier, third tier kind of lenders that we need to create competition haven't got that branch network. So when that customer thinks, I need to get a home loan, they'll go, well, where's the nearest branch? And then you know, they're back into CBA or Westpac or, or AMZ. And um, unfortunately, you know, that's what brokers were keeping them honest, I guess. You know, it was basically allowing you know, customers to go anywhere um, because a broker could lodge an application anywhere. And you don't need a branch because you've got someone there to trust and handhold you through that emotional journey. And that's why a lot of the online lenders will struggle because, you know, it's such an emotional journey. You're buying a house. You want to eyeball someone. You want to know that someone's there to coach you through it. And then when things hit the fan, you know, lost paperwork or it's not getting assessed or the assessor's declining your loan or whatever it is, you've got someone to manage that process that you can trust. And going to a branch is where you'll go over just going online. Um, and so places like all those other lenders that haven't got those branch networks won't be able to compete, um, unfortunately, you know, as well as the big four. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the UK, of course, went through this. So they, they had a mortgage market review about five years ago. And one of the strategies there was to follow the same route because they argued that commissions were, again, uh, conflicted and therefore you didn't know whether you were getting good advice or bad advice, et cetera, et cetera. So in the UK, we have a lot of brokers now who are actually fixed fee um, advisors and can effectively provide advice across the whole of the market. And the consumer pays somewhere around 250 to 300 pounds for that initial, initial advice. Um, plus potentially other services that is bolted around it, right? There are others that are tied to specific lenders. So you can get some advice from a lender and the lender pays essentially that particular advisor, but that particular advisor or broker cannot give a whole of market view. And it has to be declared up front that they're only giving advice around a particular sort of slug of the market. So that's how it's polarized out in the UK. Um, yeah, and that's perfect for the big four, right? Because yeah. A and Z are going to have their mobile bankers, CBA will, and everyone will have their mobile bankers. And then, you know, you have these other brokers that are, are trying to give you the best advice, but you've got to pay a fee. And, you know, people just naturally don't like paying fees. So they'll they'll naturally just go, well, that'll do. They're, they're going to come around my house. Who cares that it's CBA? Uh, I don't really mind. I just want the loan. And, um, you know, that, that service is already getting provided. 60% of loans that brokers are doing because they're already doing a good job there. Now, the, the problem is, is the conflicts and where it all goes wrong and gives poor customer outcomes. And so what we need to do is, rather than just completely ruin the current model where most businesses won't be profitable, won't exist, let's work with what they're doing and figure out if there's a better way 
to create because it's already good consumer outcomes because you wouldn't get 60% market share and growing year on year if you weren't providing a good service, you know, and that's, that's the, the story here. If, if market share was going the other way, um, and the Royal Commission wasn't all about mortgage brokers. It wasn't all these stories about all the bad things that mortgage brokers did. You know, you look at the things that CBA did and AMP did and, you know, these institutions, these are much worse than, um, you know, generally what the outcomes of mortgage brokers were. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I think I said uh, further up the show, you know, my sense was that mortgage brokers have become effectively the, the, the linchpin, you know, the scapegoat in terms of actually some of the issues, right? But as you say, it's much broader than that. But let me turn to the other question, which is the best interest question, because that's the other thing that uh, effectively Hain has recommended from a mortgage broker perspective, that he wants to see the best interests um, obligation a la financial planners. What's your thoughts about that? I'm all for it, but I'm a financial advisor, and I just, I've always thought about it that it's stupid to be, have a loan that's not unsuitable, right? And it's so grey. Like, look, is this loan the best loan that the client can possibly get based on all the information you know about them? And then you need to document that and be sure that that is the best option. And you know, and so the, what this is going to do, though, is, is not going to make the compliance, the paperwork less for brokers. It's going to make it more. And it's almost to a broker needs to provide a statement of advice to provide a recommendation on a loan, which is going to take more time, more effort, more research, which is going to add to the cost of providing that service. Now, that's great for consumers, and it should be like that anyway, and I'm all for it. It's just that, you know, not only are you reducing their, you know, saying you've got to pay a fee, but you're also increasing compliance. And so, you know, that's making it even harder for brokers. So I'm all for it, 100%, because I'm an advisor and I see it that way. Um, it's just that you've got to, you've got to understand that that's actually going to you know cr to do that properly you're going to have to create a lot more paperwork to document that best advice yeah and a uk analogy again a similar process gone on there and effectively the best advice came in and the compliance costs nearly doubled for brokers okay. compared with where it was previously so effectively what it means is that the whole economic model for being a broker is now fundamentally different because effectively you've got higher costs in terms of uh, compliance and making sure that it is in the best interest of the clients and being able to demonstrate it post the event. And then you've got the question of if the commission effectively is now fixed fee, you know, and it comes from the consumer, then you're caught on both sides. And that's, so the question then is, is there now a sustainable future for mortgage brokers? What do you think? Do you think, do you think there is? Not really. If, if, if the current recommendations come in and that's uh and you know labor are going to win the election you know it's nothing's changed it's highly likely that they're going to win the election you know they're doing their best to not win it but you know they're going to win it and they're a dollar ten they come in and they go in harder what than you know and they don't even allow for you know an upfront commission to be exist and it's all flat feet i don't think there is a real sustainable career for a mortgage broker um you know if you to, to run the numbers and to do a hundred, if you, let's say it was two thousand dollars, you got paid as a fee. To do a hundred clients in a year, you got no idea how much paperwork that would be, and that would mean that you'd make two hundred thousand dollars as a business, but you'd have all the compliance, the office, the risk, the time. You know, I don't think many brokers and with no saleable value to your business because there's no ongoing kind of fee there. So I just don't think it's, it would be something that people would want to pursue. Um, and, you know, so I, I just don't think there'd be an industry. And that's, the, and I think the banks know that, you know, and that's what they want. They don't want mortgage brokers to be there because then they don't have less competition and people go back to branches. And that's the big four just keep getting bigger. And, and the good thing with what brokers were doing was they were actually reducing the amount of loans at big fours uh, and creating more competition and making an e even playing field. And we all need that in our lives. You know, we need more people to be competing to give us better deals. Sure. Yeah, and it's interesting, of course, because the CEOs, when they gave their evidence, were pretty much to a man, um, arguing that uh, effectively brokers, you know, weren't necessarily the right solution, or uh, there were different ways, effectively, that brokers op could operate. So, you you would think that there was a bit of common interest <laughs> among amongst the big players, right? I find that amazing that they would they would say that because you know when you look at where they get their new customers from, it's not people walking off the street saying, "I want to open up an A and Z bank account," you know. Hmm. They'll do that. They'll go do that with ING or something because it's zero fees. But you know, they, they don't really get customers that way. Generally speaking, they win the mortgage first, so they steal you from CBA to ANZ. Once they've got your mortgage, that's when they sell you a credit card, you know. And then once they've got your credit card, then the idea is to get you some home contents insurance mm -hmm. or personal loan or to look at other things. And that's the whole banking model: is win your mortgage 
and then start selling other products around it. And that's why it's so important for the banks to control your mortgage and that's why they care about it so much. And so, you know, I guess the consumers don't really understand that, you know, it's not it's not just a mortgage. That's not what they're thinking about you. They're think, seeing you as a customer that they want to win and start to sell you other things. Right, and, and you're hi- highlighting a very important point there because one of the things that uh, Hain has said is that this whole idea of a sales-driven culture where effectively what you're doing is trying to flog products all the time was actually part of the fundamental problem that created the poor behaviour inside the financial system, right? Because of everybody was seeing customers effectively as cannon fodder to sell more things to. And and, the, and that's and end of the day, they are a business, a bank, you know? And so the branches are an individual business. They've all run under individual businesses and they've all got targets and every single person in the branch has got targets. The person you walk in and speak to on the counter has got to make certain number of referrals to the personal banker. The personal banker has to sell a certain amount of personal loans, credit cards every every month and every day. And so the whole idea of a, it's a business, it's got to sell products. And so what they're trying to do is to get you as a customer and then sell you other services like every other business. And unfortunately though, it's financial products are not comp- are not simple and they if you get them wrong you have huge impacts on someone's future so mis-selling credit cards you might think that's not a bad thing but if someone goes into credit card debt the amount of stress that creates and the ch- you know and mis-selling you know all other products as well so i think that's the problem here and that's why it's so annoying that you know they didn't go for vertical alignment and say well banks can't provide financial advice they can't provide insurance advice which is highly conflicted and highly not not independent at all Sure. Well, I think, the, yes, I was surprised about the uh, integration and the fact that, you know, Hain basically says it's okay to provide advice and sell products and manufacture products so they still control the value chain, which means essentially that from a customer perspective, you actually don't know what the cross subsidization across the value chain is and you don't know whether the advice that you're getting from that individual organisation is actually the best advice or whether, in fact, it's simply just a flog the product that's already in the system. Yeah, and it's not even sold under advice. It's sold as like just general guidance and facts and figures. But, no. you know, we all know that if, if, you know, at the end of the day, those people in those branches, they bend the rules because they're like, well, I've got KPIs. I need to convince you that this is the best product for you. And as soon as that happens, you start moving away from general advice to personal advice. And then that whole thing gets very murky. And then you get, then they get all the problems with mis-selling your products again. And so I don't think, this Royal Commission has solved any of that. And, mm. you know, I think if we come back in five years' time, they'll still be mis-selling of products in branches. Yeah, okay. No, I, th- I tend to agree with you. I think that we've probably um, hooked the uh, issues into the long grass, but fundamentally not really addressed them. What, what about the question of um, cultural change inside the bank? So one of the things that Hayne was big on was to say it should be the board, it should be the senior executives in the banks who should actually drive more customer-centric behaviour down into their organisations. Do you think that's realistic? Unfortunately, it's a capitalist business and, you know, it's there to sell financial products. And, you know, I do laugh at NAB's marketing campaign more than money. Like, you know, it's, it's not really. They're, they're there to sell financial products, really. Yeah. You know, they're not independent financial advice businesses that really care about you and your future and want you to. Um, and so if there's a better deal, they're not going to come and say to you, NAB's not going to call you up and say, just want to let you know, ING if, could save you. 50 basis points or did you know that you shouldn't use you know our super funds you've actually got flaws with our insurance um you'd actually be better on level cover and you should go to tal or aia you know they don't re- they're not really there to give you that guidance and to make sure that what you're doing is the right thing they're there to give you the information hope that you take the products and you know and leave it there and that's kind of the whole the way the bank's built Right, and so what you're really saying is it's unlikely that we're going to see substantial change in behaviour simply because that's not the way that the whole organisation is wired, not, it's actually not the way that it's built from top to bottom, and, and there's no real reason for them to switch that, to switch that around. No, they'll just, they'll just have to obviously um, you know, run their business in a way that you know, was in the rules and mm. bend those rules a little bit so they can make margin, you know, mm. and... That's um, end of the day. They've got shareholders. They've they're highly profitable. They're highly, and they've got a lot of people who love their income and their dividends and live off those. Maybe not without the franking credits, but you know, there's lots of people there that really just want to keep them profitable. And you know, and they're they're getting paid and they're incentivized to do that. So they're going to be doing. They're going to look at their balance sheet every single day and they're going to be like, how can we tweak this? Now, customer outcomes are great and they're good stories that they want to portray, but really, end of the day, they're 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 a big business and you know they're there to to, to make money. 
Mm, okay. Now, just going over to the wealth management end of things, there was some yeah. commentary in the um, in the final report about wealth management, some changes and particular things, for example, around uh, my super not being able to actually um, charge a whole bunch of fees and some grandfathering of uh, um, you know the old commission structures and things. Um, was there anything there that jumped out at you in terms of either good or bad? I loved it all, to be honest. I, especially the super without one default fund. Um, I think that's amazing. I've, I've, I'm all for that. I think we should all only have one fund. There's a big risk with that is around people's insurance and making sure that they've thought about what insurance they need and they get and like make sure they've got that all set up the right way just in case they lose cover with you know them rolling funds together. But once you've got one fund and you've got the right amount of insurance set up the right way, it doesn't have to be in that super fund. It can be separate and that's probably better. Um, then that's fine. There's nothing wrong with having all your money in one fund, and especially if it's a low-cost fund. And the My Super um, is, is is a good starting point, and it'll get better, and it'll get lower cost fees. And there's competition in the super sector. You've got lots of people, and that's what we want. That's why fees are going down. You know, and that's the, been the biggest benefit of industry funds is it's pushed the cost of super funds lower and lower. Um, and hopefully that just keeps continuing. So I'm all for that. Grandfathering of old commissions, I think that's that it shouldn't have happened anyway. A lot of those investment products um, were very expensive, um, and you know there's no real advice being provided. Um, it's just that they got sold in these complex products with had huge exit fees, and they basically the advisors bought that, and then they just literally taking this fee because the client you know can't leave because of an exit fee a lot of the time, or just haven't switched on. Um, doesn't really just haven't got got a bit of apathy there and just haven't looked at it, um, and so you can't just be taking advantage of people just because they're, you know, not doing enough for their future. Okay, no, it's very interesting. So, so a more of a tick for the wealth management side than the bro the broking side, um, and then what about the whole issue of the um, the regulators and APRA and ASIC and you know basically still keeping the Twin Peaks and basically saying well we're going to actually have somebody try and help sort out who does what amongst the two, but basically nothing much changes other than they want to use the courts more than um, uh, enforceable undertakings. Um, I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, ASIC will, will have a lot of work to do around vertical alignment. And if you're trying to enforce best interest duty, that's where you're going to be looking, right? You're going to be looking at comfort, uh, advisors that are licensed through banks and are, is their advice conflicted? And are they just recommending the product that that bank provides? Now, that bank wouldn't you know, be profitable if it didn't have people selling its products. And unfortunately, that's going to be where a lot of ASIC you know, is going to probably should be putting their attention. I think you know, more broadly, if you're going to self-license advisors directly with ASIC, um, you know, that's a big undertaking. You'd have to remove all your dealer groups. You'd have 20,000 advisors directly to ASIC. You need massive infrastructure. I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think maybe it'll happen in time. Um, I think the financial advice industry is probably going to halve in number of advisors in the next five years anyway because there's a new upskilling of advisors new education standards and most advisors won't because the average advisor age is over 55 most advisors are going i'm not going to bother with all that and you know it's hardly that you know haven't got lots of people coming into financial advice thinking it's an amazing job and things like that so we're going to see probably a halving of advisors number any anyway and it'll be interesting to see how it all kind of flows out Sure. Okay. Well, as we can sort of come to the end of our, our conversation, Chris, is there anything else that you'd want to highlight to the viewers in terms of, you know, from the Royal Commission, something which I haven't touched on that you, you'd want to underscore? I think the biggest thing is probably the responsible lending and around property. You know, if we take away how mortgage brokers get paid in financial advice, you know, what do your listeners really care about? And if a lot of them are thinking about property, whether they've got property or they're thinking about investing in property, one of the biggest things that drives that market is credit and access to credit. And how easy is it to get it? And and what the Royal Commission could have done was bring in much strict, uh, stricter criteria around verification of expenses, and they haven't recommended that. So if you know that is to me a positive news story. Now it's only one little positive news story. There's a lot of negative, so it doesn't mean the property market's going to go up, but it is a positive. But we've still got some cases coming up with you know Westpac and around responsible lending. And we don't know how it's all going to play out. If that does change, though, and you do have to verify every expense and living cost, that is going to have a huge impact on the market. So, you know, for, for the property market, that was a win in terms of holding its value. Um, and if you were think, hoping the market would crash, that's not good news. 
Um, but, you know, that was an interesting point, I think, around him. Yeah, no, you're right. So I think the hem thing was very interesting. So basically he said, um, you know, the current hem as it is, is it currently incarnated at such a low level is not acceptable, but effectively a higher hem benchmark as a backstop is potentially okay. But he also went on to say that nevertheless it will be uh, beneficial for people to actually look at expenses in more detail and actually highlight the fact that several banks had actually gone into a lot more detail. Uh, but then he also said that the, uh, the West Bank asset case may you know, cast some light yeah. on that, it may not. <laughs> and then his final comment was, and if they could turn around and say, well, the HEM is OK, he thinks that should be regulated out because he doesn't think that the current benchmark for HEM is acceptable. So my read on that, along, along with yours, I think, is it doesn't mean it's going to uh, open the credit taps, but neither is it going to tighten them. So it's pretty much the current trajectory. But yeah. that already means consistently tighter lending standards than we had a year ago yeah. will continue into the future. So the chances are that uh, effectively credit momentum will, will not increase, but perhaps won't decrease as much as some were thinking it might uh, if, if they had really gone holus bolus for, uh, for massive tightening. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like, I think the cans are already tight, right? And it was just going to be another big tighten of it. Mm. And I don't think they've loosened it at all. Um, it's still going to be exactly the same. And I think, uh, I think the... What the Royal Commission has done has scared the hell out of the banks around responsible lending. Yep. And so I don't see it in the short term going back to how it was um, a few years ago and money just kind of being easy access, I guess. Um, I just can't see that happening. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a political football right now. And um, the next few months are going to be interesting because, you know, it's kind of perfect timing for, you know, the election and the Royal Commission within three months. And um, it's interesting to see whether the actual common sense actually comes into the market and gets delivered or whether it's just vote winning. And that's what's that's why it's bad timing. Yeah. Well, I suspect that there's going to be lots of words and lots of, uh, you know, yes, you know, consumer trust and consumer confidence and those sorts of things. And, uh, you know, we, we'll turn our attention to all 76 and stuff. But whether, in fact, it all sticks or whether it doesn't stick and how it plays out, I think is still very much up in the air. So to my mind, there's a lot of uncertainty ahead. And, and, and whilst some have argued that the, you know, the Royal Commission re report out has basically ended all the uncertainty, my own view is, no, 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 it's just changed the uncertainty from one form to another form. The election's there. There's un some uncertainty about the trajectory beyond the election and how it's going to be implemented. So I suspect that 2019 will continue to be a rather uncomfortable year for the finance sector. Yeah, and I think the whole purpose of the Royal Commission was meant to, you know, be the day of reckoning for the banks. The banks to get everything out, you know, money laundering, you know, stealing clients of dead people, like all these stories, horrible stories, you know, CBA fiddling kids' accounts. Like, you know, there's so many bad stories with it, and it was meant to all come out. And then, this, you know, the, the big four were meant to have, you know, huge losses and, you know, fines and people go to jail and things like that. None of that's happened. You only have to look at the share prices today and you can see that, you know, all the big four, AMP, everyone's very happy because they've got away with it. And that's to me, is the, the biggest failing of it all. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think put a diary note in for five years down the track, there'll be another review and 100%. we'll go around the houses again. <laughs> yeah, we will for sure. And that's, that's, that's the sad part. You know, this, this was a moment. This is an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, it was an opportunity to rebuild the financial advice industry without product conflict. And, you know, and in the mortgage industry, it's, it's an opportunity to do that as well. But what they've actually done is actually just kill the industry. And I just don't think, um, you know, I do feel for, you know, all the brokers out there that are doing a great service. But, you know, unfortunately, they won't have a profitable business model. You know, for me, luckily, I've been an advisor for like 13 years now. And, you know, I can evolve and change and, you know, repackage my business because I've got that knowledge and I've got the client base and it's not I can do it. But a lot of people can't, and um, unfortunately, the less brokers mean less competition, really, because less loans will go to, you know, get spread around. They'll all just go back to branches. Yeah, Chris, thank you very much for your time today. I'm afraid an opportunity missed, I think we're both saying. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> but I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll catch up again in a few weeks and see how it's playing out. Yeah, Thanks. it's going to be very interesting. Thanks, Martin. Good okay. to talk to you. Thanks. Bye.